We have finished the examples of polynomial division, both long division and synthetic division. And now we want to see how this applies to the remainder theorem and the factor theorem. Before we get into the specifics of those, let us review a quick example here. Given a polynomial function, g of x is equal to x to the fourth minus 2x squared plus 3, I want you to figure out what g of negative 2 is. So pause the video and work that on your own. Okay, so that gives me negative 2 to the fourth minus 2 times a negative 2 squared plus 3. Negative 2 to the fourth gives me a positive 16. Negative 2 squared gives me 4 times a negative 2 gives me negative 8. And so 16 minus 8 gives me 8. 8 plus 3 gives me 11. So my answer here is g of negative 2 equals 11. Okay, keep that in mind. We'll come back to this here in a second. Let's talk about now the remainder theorem. The formal explanation is if a number such like c is substituted in for x in the polynomial f of x, then the result f of c is the remainder. Seems pretty reasonable, right? Seems like just what we did right here. If my number c is substituted in for x, then whatever we get out is the remainder. Yes, but this is what we're talking about when we do it in the synthetic division, not just in our typical way that we simplify these things. The remainder theorem is here to give us an additional way to simplify things like this. So we did g of negative 2 by just substituting it in and evaluating it in the last example, but we can also do it by using the synthetic division method. So let's go ahead and set this up. This is my polynomial, so I'm going to put those coefficients in my synthetic division. I have a 1x to the fourth. Remember, if you're missing a term, you must absolutely put that in. I'm missing an x cubed, so I need to put in a 0. I have a negative 2x squared. I'm missing a single x term, so I must put in a 0 there. And then my constant term is 3. So here are my coefficients for my synthetic division. Now I need to figure out what to divide by. This is not in polynomial format like my other examples were. Notice this was x minus 1 and x plus 3. Here, this is just in number format. It's just g of negative 2. So I don't need to do any manipulation here. I just divide it by negative 2. Okay, so here's the process. Bring down the 1, multiply negative 2, add negative 2, multiply positive 4, add positive 2, multiply negative 4, add negative 4, multiply positive 8, and so when I add these, that gives me 11. Remember my last digit in any situation is my remainder. So my remainder here is 11. But what did we get when we did this the other way? Notice that we also got our answer to be 11. So that's what the remainder theorem says. It says you can do this by substituting in negative 2 and simplifying it that way, or you can do it by using synthetic division or even long division if you prefer, and whatever value that you get out, that's going to be the same thing as computing g of negative 2. So our answer here was 11. So this is an additional way to evaluate functions such as these. Now, my students usually ask, well, why is that better? Well, sometimes synthetic division is actually a quicker process than doing it the old school way, such as this here. So it just gives you an alternative way, sometimes easier, maybe sometimes more difficult than the original way. Okay, now that we know how the remainder theorem works, let's see how to utilize it. So we're given this function h of x here, x cubed plus 2x squared plus x plus 2. We want to use the remainder theorem, meaning you're going to be forced to use synthetic division to determine if the given number c in these examples are a zero of the polynomial. 
So we want to see what the remainder is. If the remainder is zero, that means the number that we plugged in is a zero of our polynomial. Or it means that it is an x-intercept on our graph, if that's something that's important to us. So we get to use synthetic division to see whether these numbers are zeros or are x-intercepts. Let me do the first example for you, and then let's see if you can do example two and example three on your own. So I use my coefficients. I'm not missing any terms, so I'm just going to list them straight across. 1x cubed, 2x squared, 1x, and then 2. So those are what I use in my synthetic division. It gives me my pure number here, so I'm just going to use that given number. Okay, now my synthetic division. Bring down the 1, multiply gives me 5, add gives me 7, multiply gives me 35, add gives me 36, multiply gives me 180, and add gives me 182. So remember, this last number here is our remainder. If our remainder is 0, then that tells us this number 5 is a 0 of our function. Clearly, this remainder is not 0, so that tells us that c equals 5 is not a 0 of the function, meaning it's not an x-intercept on the graph. But if we wanted to use this in graph terms, this doesn't tell us an x-intercept, but it does give us a point. So pretty cool that it gives us the point that our x value is 5 and our y value is 182. So our official answer here is that it's not a 0 because we didn't come up to a remainder of 0, but it does give us a different point on the graph if the graph is our ultimate goal for problems like these. Okay. So why don't you do example two and example three on your own to see if either one of those are zeros of the polynomial. So I'm guessing that when you did it in example two, you didn't have any problems. You just use your coefficients, one, two, one, two, the same as in example one, and you divided it by negative two. Bring down the one, multiply gives me negative two, Add gives me 0, multiply gives me negative 2, add gives me negative 1, multiply gives me negative 2, and so when I add, that gives me a remainder of 0. So that tells me here that c equal negative 2 is a 0 of the function. So that means if I were to substitute negative 2 into our function, if I were to figure out what h of negative 2 is, that would give me 0. And also that would tell me that I have an x-intercept at 0, the ordered pair negative 2, 0. So all of this put together tells me quite a bit of important information. So example 2 probably didn't cause you any problems. Pretty cool to see all those parts working together. But let's talk about example three then. I'm guessing you probably had an issue with example three. When we do this, we're going to set it up the same way. Coefficients one, two, one, two. And we're going to divide it by the number we see, which is i. Now, it may seem impossible to do to divide it by an imaginary number. But all you need to do is keep the real number consistent with the real numbers and the imaginary numbers consistent with the imaginary numbers. Just keep them separated. Okay, so following our process, bring down my first digit of 1, multiply. 1 times i gives me i, so I need to add. Now to add 2 plus i, they are not like terms. One's real, one's imaginary. So I just have to write down what I have, a 2 plus i. I'm going to put that in parentheses just so you can see that those are stuck together. Okay, now I need to multiply i times 2 plus i. If you need to do this somewhere else for scratch work, I encourage you to do so. Let me do it up here. Let me distribute my i through. When I take i times 2, that gives me 2i. When I take i times i, that gives me i squared. 
But remember, I squared transforms back into a real number. I squared is the same thing as negative 1. So this gives me 2i plus a negative 1. So let me go ahead and put that up here, but let me just rearrange the order because we're used to seeing it in the other order. The real number first, the imaginary number second. So negative 1 plus 2i. Okay, now when I have to add 1 and negative 1 plus 2i, I only add my like terms. So my 1 plus my negative 1 cancel out, and so that just leaves me with 2i. So now I need to multiply 2i times i. Again, if you have to do that as scratch work, please go ahead and do so. 2i times i gives me 2i squared, where we know i squared is the same thing as negative 1. And so 2 times negative 1 gives me negative 2. So that's what goes over here. And now I can add. 2 plus a negative 2 gives me 0. That's my last number. So we know that that guy there gives me 0. So not only can I have real numbers, such as negative 2 being zeros of my function, I can also have imaginary numbers being zeros of my function. So c equals i is a zero of my function. So I can also have imaginary numbers coming out to be zeros. And we'll learn a lot more about this in the next section. Okay, so this example here is to show you, again, that not only real numbers can be zeros, but imaginary numbers can be zeros as well. And now you can see a bigger advantage of our remainder theorem trying to simplify this using synthetic division is going to be easier than trying to do this with our old school techniques. If I wanted to figure out what h of i was by just substituting it in for each variable in my expression, that's definitely going to be more complicated than trying to do it like we did over here. I have another example of these, so that's where I'm going to start in my next video.